All right, good morning, everybody. Mike Courtney here, Mass Mutual Eastern Pennsylvania, and I'm coming to you from the Philadelphia suburbs, talking to Steve Parisi from IBC Global. Steve, happy hump day. It's the middle of April. We're getting there. The weather's getting nice. I know you love it. You're outside for your runs in the morning. How you doing? I am fantastic. Had a beautiful run this morning. I feel Pretty great. Good. Yeah, got a good night's sleep last night, so I feel fantastic. Thanks good. for asking. <laughs> so we were Steve and I were having a little chat before um, uh, before this this uh, podcast, and you know, I was talking about some. I, I'm always trying to talk to folks about um, you know permanent insurance and try not to look at it as an expense. You know. Um, hard to do, tough kind of mentality to adopt, but once you get there, um, where, where I have gotten to, uh, in my own personal life, it it really can be kind of a game changer for, for how you structure your assets and, and what's important to you. Um, when you're, what kind of objections do you see typically, uh, from clients who, are looking at other investment vehicles or are really just kind of taking the mindset of their insurance premium is a, is a hard expense, not a, you know, not a long-term investment. Yeah, no, that, that objection I think is the first one to overcome just life insurance being an expense because typically any type of insurance is an expense you pay for it. And if something bad happens, that's when, that's why we have insurance, whether it's car insurance, disability insurance, health insurance, or life insurance. And there's a lot more insurances out there, but that's typically insurance expensive. Now with that said, cash value life insurance is much different because you can set it up to be much different uh, in the sense that it's not an expense if we are transferring assets if you set everything up properly, a cash value life insurance policy is a safe, liquid, tax-free area to position money. But without getting into everything, an objection we hear a lot is that it is expensive. I don't want to pay money for life insurance, where most people we work with, frankly, say, I don't care about the death benefit. And the other objection, so number one was expense. The other one is really the individual who compares it to other investments, if we're comparing it to what we could earn in the stock market, what we could earn in real estate, what we could earn in our business, an IUL, anything it might be. So you've got the expense, that's objection number one, and then number two would definitely be comparing it to other investments and hey, I think I can, or I know I can do better elsewhere. Right. So I think for us, uh, you know, you said something interesting before. Um, and, you know, what I always see is uh, there's been a big uh, mentality and a lot of people talking about, you know, when they're putting together a plan or they're trying to structure their investment portfolio, diversification yeah. is very important. Um I don't think people realize that this can be a really powerful tool for diversification. You know, like I've taken the approach that once you get to the point where you've got a, you know, I'm talking about myself personally, I've got whole life policies that have accumulated cash. My rate of return is positive. It's tax-free accumulation. It's liquid. It's not correlated to the market. I can tap into it at any time. That really becomes my safe money, my emergency money. Yeah. You know, I mean, if, you know, there's no reason for me to have six months worth of savings uh, or six months worth of expenses sitting in a savings account if I've got 12 months worth of expenses yeah. sitting inside whole life policies that God forbid something happens, I can tap into and not even drain, borrow right. against, but still see still see growth there. Um, it's tough to get people to, to turn that switch on. Though. Yeah, it, it is because you've got the word life insurance there. <laughs> I mean, no yeah. matter what happens, that's going to, to come up. Um, you know, how I'll often approach that is uh, – on your point, as far as being a safe area, no matter what happens, you've got a positive return, keeps going up. 
Many will approach cash value life insurance. Typically, this is with people that, that have a substantial amount of money, net worth, you know, is, is well above a million. They'll view it almost as the fixed part of their portfolio, almost a, an alternative to a, a muni bond. We hear that a lot where an individual will say, okay, if I do everything right, and what to mean, to emphasize what I mean when I say do things right, is the policy is designed properly. If I'm putting in $100,000 per year, I know how to design it. I've got a minimal premium and I see my equity up front, the majority of it, 80 to 90% cash rich from day one. Early break even point with one of the major mutual companies. That's when I say do it right, that we've seen those policies deliver. If that's the case, I mean, a policy, when you look at the cash value, may produce between a, a three and a half and five and a half net internal rate of return over the life of the policy. So if we say, hey, it's let's just- there's no, there's no muni bond fund out there that's, that's still in that. There's not. And when I say that, I mean, I'm basing it off of where the present dividend rate environment is and shooting it a bit conservative. You know, if we look at history policies, we have some on, book, on the books or, or records of them that have done better than those returns. But to shoot a conservative, if I say, okay, it's going to produce, say, at four, say a four and a half percent, that's going to be your net IRR over the life of the policy, even if it's four percent, that's a tax-free yield. You've got access to it anytime you want. It's very attractive in that respect. And if things go very, very well in the stock market and economy, I've got that 4%. If things go very, very poorly, I've got that 4% or whatever it is. And that's that's the type of individual that is, is attracted to that product in the sense that they don't have to worry about it. If they're focused on their business, they're focused on other things, they've got money in the market, this is money, they say, okay, if I've got a lump sum over here, I don't have to think about it. Every year I'm going to see it go up. So that's good. I can focus on other more important things. That's where a lot of individuals are attracted to it. And it does help overcome the expense component because once they, once anyone sees, okay, if I'm earning a, a net internal rate of return, not a dividend, but a net, net IRR of call it that 4%, that's not an expense. It's positive growth on my money. Why do you think, um, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of reasons for this that are, that are pretty obvious, but just like your thoughts on why, you know, just your average solid financial advisor doesn't make that a part of their planning process. So yeah. if I'm an advisor and I'm talking to a 50 year old business owner who looks to me for both insurance and investment advice. And, um, you know, I've got whatever kind of qualified plan he's got in place. I've got whatever kind of investments he's got in place. And he's asking me to manage that for him. Why am I not looking at um, some kind of permanent life insurance that's got, that's structured correctly, that's got solid IRR that can be the fixed part of the portfolio? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's usually because someone is trained anti-cash value life insurance, trained to uh, focus on the, the market. You can always do better with an investment portfolio from a pure return standpoint, which frankly you can a lot of times, depending on an individual's risk tolerance and such. Yeah. But typically it, it's a, an individual's training. And if, like I view it, if you've been trained that, Either A, life insurance is the worst thing, or B, you're on the other side of the fence and investments are the worst thing. That's a battle that goes on all the time where it's on that point you just mentioned there, the individual that's not going to mention or recommend life insurance but truly believes it is a horrible place to position money. Don't do it. We can do so much better if you just continue to look at the managed money over here with me. And then the insurance guy is going to say, abandon that managed money. You've got fees. You've got taxes. The market could tank. <laughs> Scare them. Yeah. Get it all out and put it in life insurance. And frankly, I don't think one should go either way. Everything's got a, got a place. But to get back on track and answer your question is why that happens. I think it's training and just an individual's belief. 
based off the data they've been whatever provided. kind of culture they're in yeah mm -hmm. yeah that that happens and it's on both sides it's not to say the investment guys are bad or the insurance guys are bad most will fight with each other the person who's really going to crush it and hit a home run in business is the individual that knows how to marry the two together because they work beautifully the individuals I work with that that do extremely well are, are worth over 10 million or close to that that nine nine figure 100 million net worth range or getting there very quickly. They don't do just one thing. Like they're doing everything. They're heavily invested in their business. They've got real estate, cash value life insurance. They view as a safe area to position their money large death benefit, which is great from an estate tax standpoint, but it's set up properly where they can access the money if and when they want to, but they're not doing just one thing. And their attorney or attorneys will not advise that they do just one thing. So I always view it as the people that are doing very well, they've got those big, big piles of money, they've got it figured out from a financial standpoint. Why would someone else try and do it differently because they found a better way. <laughs> like, no. Right. They, well, yeah. and, and those people, those folks that you're talking about, those, you know, the sophisticated high net worth yeah. people are, um, you know, what they're doing. It's not rocket science. It's each one of these avenues that they're going down, there's pitfalls yeah. and there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. Yeah. And sometimes it's not always totally black and white. There could be some gray area. But if you're working with someone who, like yourself, or like me, or like you know a lot of the professionals that we work with, um, who knows what they're doing and is trying to maximize uh, the end result for the client and is careful and diligent in selecting product and selecting structure and design, any of those avenues that you go down, you should have some. You should have. Success. Will. Yeah, yeah. It, it'll work out over time. Um, you know, there was a, a case years ago, an individual, I, I bring up the story a lot, but I'm going to add another element to it. A individual, he owned a construction company, did really well. They were looking at policies for their executives. So they're looking at a, an executive benefit plan with cash value life insurance. And he had, I think it was about seven policies. So he had several whole life policies. Some were 30 years old. We got to measure the returns and such, and they performed. Most of them were with reputable, the, the major mutual companies and a couple of smaller ones. But he made a comment. He said, you know, other than the share in my business that, that I've owned over time, these products have been one of my best performing assets because they're the whole life products, because no matter what happens, they just increase over time. And he liked that. But at the same time, he was invested in his business cash value, life insurance, stocks, bonds, real estate. He had everything. And I can guarantee there were years he would say, my real estate is my best investment. Right. Uh, yeah. The stock market, my stocks here, these are my best investments. The years they're really hitting home runs. Sure. The point is he had everything. He was well diversified. He built it up over time. So I view it as everything has a place. A cash value life insurance product, when comparing it to other return, other other assets and such, you can do a return analysis, look at the taxes, but really <laughs> to say it is what it is when it's designed properly, you've got that net IRR between three and a half and five and a half percent. That's what it's going to do. And then personally, instead of having money just in a bank account, if I can use my money in my cash value life insurance policy to go into other business ventures, into my present business, in other investments. I use that as a tool to complement everything else. Yep. That's all. And, and see how I can work everything together to the best degree possible rather than take the stance that, hey, everything else stinks. It's my way or the highway. Yeah, <laughs> there's no all or nothing. It's all building blocks. And, and uh, you know, this is, a, this is a really strong, solid building block that we've seen yeah. in real life. <laughs> Um, work really well in a, in a variety of different situations and scenarios. Um, I think a lot of times people are anxious to, uh, you know, put a portfolio in place and like, this is, this is my, this is what I'm, you know, this is what, what I have. And you know, these things take time. 
Yeah, they do. And it's a great asset to utilize. I think where it's attractive to a lot of people is there's a lot of awareness out there as far as wealthy individuals, big banks, corporations have used it for a long time. Yeah. So that is going to intrigue anyone to say, okay, life insurance, no. Copying what the wealthy do, yes. So why is it that they're using life insurance? Yeah, like what's going on here? That creates the the intriguing part. And now it's just understanding how it works or seeing an example that is truly used by corporations and wealthy individuals. The problem, in my opinion, is a lot of times someone... (laughs) Here's about a bank or corporation using cash value life insurance and they're cash rich on the balance sheet day one and then they're pitched on the policy that <laughs> is not cash rich day one to put it that way. It takes 7, 10, 12 years just to break even and you hear like why would I do this and why on earth would a bank or corporation do that? Like they won't. It's a different design. That's the thing. So it's got to be you got to be working with someone competent on knowing how to design that policy competent and willing because the more cash a consumer has up front in their product to simplify this, the more cash they they have up front, the less compensation an agent will generate up front. That's that's how it works when you look at how life insurance commissions work. So that's where someone has to know how to set it up properly and also be willing in that respect. You know, it's funny you talk about six or seven years down the line. I this happens all the time, but just in the last couple of weeks, it's happened a, a bunch of times with clients who bought policies years ago with the idea in mind of funding for five, funding premium for five years or seven years or yeah. nine years or whatever the case may be. Something short of 10 or 11 years, let's say. And they're coming to the end of that and we're doing an annual review and they're looking at everything. And um, they're paying the next premium and they're continuing to fund the policy. And now they're pumped up about it because now they're seeing real, uh, real growth. And it's very easy for them to sit back and say, this doesn't feel like an expense anymore. Like it did during the first couple of years. Yeah. That that's very common um, where someone comes in with a plan. Hey, I want to fund it for a short period of time. They fund it and they look at it and say, Hey, I, I like this. I've got some money. Can I continue to add it? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Yeah. If you want to keep going at the same level or a reduced level, you make it flexible. But that that does happen a lot. And I, I love that. It always makes sense to do that, to fund an existing policy if we've got the room to continue to pump money in, into it before opening a new one, just from a cash value growth standpoint. But yeah, that that's... We see that a lot too. It's I found that the people who are most excited about it are the ones who are also doing the most grumbling on an annual basis about paying the premium. Yeah. 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 I'm like, I don't know. You, <laughs> this is what you wanted. Eh? <laughs> yeah. That's usually how it works. I get it. Hey, you know, this all is of a horrible. sudden they flip and it's like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. Yeah, once you start to see the the value, uh, that's funny how that works. I I would say that probably happens to all of us with so many things. Yeah, we're not even aware of, but uh, I get it. <laughs> yeah. How much of your how much of your day is is consumed with that with ongoing, um, you know, policy reviews and mm-hmm. client um, follow ups? Is that a lot? Are you doing a lot of that, or you have staff designated to do that? Yeah, so we do have a a staff that does do that, our client relations department, as far as following up with individuals, getting their updated reports, enforced illustrations. We've got an online client user package, which, you know, answers a lot of commonly asked questions. But every time client relations reaches out, if you're a client, they are going to ask and offer a time to set up a review meeting with your agent. So if I'm your your agent, then yes, I'm going to meet with you, go through everything th- thoroughly if you want to do that. Um, what kind of percentage of clients want to talk on an annual basis? Yeah, um, that's a good Ball question. Function. In the first one to two years, I would say most of them do. So not all of them, but probably eight or nine out of 10. Okay. After the first couple of years, um, because we've got a lot of video content, that online user package, a lot of people use that and it's the same thing we would go over in a review meeting minus their actual data. Um, they see that and they say, hey, I'm, I'm good. Or, hey, I've got a, a couple quick questions. Um, they may email or want just a 10-minute call. But 
after, so you're sending them all the data and they might have like an online client portal anyway. Correct. So, yeah. Correct. And when they send a question to, I mean, I'm going to reply via email in the same way I would reply in a meeting. And what I say, what I mean when I say that is I'm going to put a recording together or something like that, where it's me talking, using visuals, and they get that just like we would go over in a Zoom meeting or something of that nature. That way it's it's convenient for them to understand. And then they see, say, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. I'm I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. You so, guys have a great process in place for, you know, for follow-up. So important just to kind of, you know, to keep those folks fresh and, and you know, remember who you are and what you did. And yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Always refining too. I yeah. mean, it takes time. <laughs> Well, listen, for anybody listening out there, if, um, you know, if, if you have questions or you want to learn how to maximize whole life, maximize permanent insurance, uh, both from a death benefit and cash accumulation perspective, Steve Parisi and IBC Global are absolute experts in that area, uh, both from a policy design and, you know, client service perspective. If you want to talk about Mass Mutual, Life, DI, Long-Term Care, Fixed Annuities. I'm your guy, Mike Courtney, Mass Mutual Eastern PA. Um, give me a call, reach out anytime. Steve and I are here weekly talking topics. If anybody has anything they want us to, to talk about, feel free to uh, drop us a line. We'd be happy to include it. Yeah. And um, Steve, thanks for everything. Have a great day. Yeah, likewise. You too, Mike. I'll, I'll add in there. If, if you have complex cases or wondering how to get a case approved, or if you're considering a policy, you say, hey, would this get approved via underwriting? I mean, that's what that's what Mike's group is good at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely, man. That's Definitely. the fun stuff sometimes. It, yeah, I, I'm with you. The one I called you about yesterday. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All Thank right. You. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye.